All right, we have a good crew of people. Bess, do you want to introduce? Yeah. And I'll introduce Mio. Yeah. Introduce. Hi, us. everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Bess Murphy. I'm sorry, I'm wearing a mask today, so I feel like it's harder to hear me enunciate, but we had some visitors inside of the co. But I'm the curator at the Co Center for the Arts, and I am here on site at the Co today in uh, blustery, sort of icky Santa Fe. Normally, I'd say lovely Santa Fe, but it's springtime here, so it's sort of oh. good. Um, and I'm so excited to be here for our 14th edition of Collection Spotlight, where the Co Center collaborates with First American Art Magazine to bring brilliant artists together to discuss pieces in our collection. So um, Rachel Wixom is usually here, but she's not available uh, today. So I will introduce the Co a little bit as well. Um, so the Co Center for the Arts is a art center located in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We have a collection of global indigenous art that we um, share with the public in an interactive hands-on way. So in normal times when everyone can come back and visit us here in Santa Fe, we have the collection, our amazing collection available for the public to work with hands on. Anybody can come in and research and spend time with the collection or just visit and speak to the collection, whatever you might like to do. So please keep us in mind for when you start coming back out. We'd love to have visitors and we're so excited and very honored to be able to continue this program with America. So I'll pass it over to America. Yeah, and I'll have to spotlight myself. Mm -hmm. Hi, so I'm America Meredith coming to you from Norman, Oklahoma, ancestral homelands of the Wichita and affiliated tribes. And I'm the publishing editor of First American Art Magazine. So we try to cover North and South America and we need more South American coverage. So mm -hmm. if that's your field house or Caribbean, contact me. We have a great website with our submission policy. But anyway, I'm really happy and deeply honored that Mia Marufo is here today. She's Eastern Pomo from Clear Lake Basin. She's enrolled in Robbins Rancheria, and she's also lived and learned among Yura, Koopa, Maidu, and Miwok communities, so all throughout Northern California. She has a personal artistic practice that's focused on regalia making, cuisine, and digital art, and then she teaches workshops throughout Northern California, so I actually you know, kind of uh, virtually met her through a, a toy workshop, a Thule Reed toy workshop. So she knows a lot of uh, cultural arts that you might not see, you know, in museums. But she exhibits her digital artwork uh, featuring basket uh, patterns, dancing, and pomo life throughout California. And perhaps we can bring her out to Santa Fe. Um, I do want to say really quickly that we welcome questions. You can put them in the chat and then we'll open up at the end and you can um, be able to ask Mio questions that come up to you so we can have a little conversation towards the end. So Mio, welcome. Thank you so much for being here and joining us. Oh yeah, it's always good. Um, it was, yeah, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you just said the normal introduction because most people say some kind of craziness and I'm like, hey, I have to live up to that. Please don't. Um, no, I'm we're all about humble. <laughs> <laughs> glad to be here and can't wait to uh, actually come out there physically and yes. see the museum and so see how everything is out there. I've been there once to Santa Fe for a conference and they kept us locked in the conference oh. so we didn't get to see anything. <laughs> yeah. Because they knew you wouldn't come back. <laughs> There's so much good art. I know, that. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited to be able to share these pieces with you and with everybody else attending today. So Mio, just you can be the boss. I will be the hands behind the scene. And you just guide me uh, as you want. And as you know, as we went through, you can just tell me like zoom in on that part, turn around. And so everybody will see my hands. And you can also see, I have another camera here at the Co. So you can see some of the pieces that have been selected that me selected, that me selected to speak about today. So we can just jump off wherever you want. Okay. so. The interesting thing is that you have Pomo pieces. Um, that's great uh, because 
not a lot of museums collect California Indian arts or did collect California Indian arts. Generally, they'll have a few baskets here and there, but not very often do they collect um, significant pieces. Um, your collection has kind of a variety of pieces. And I'd like to start by just kind of introducing the Pomo first. So Tintama from the Lake County tribes, hello. And we are lake, valley, and coast. We cover Lake County, Mendocino County, and Sonoma County. Um, I always like to say that we have the most beautiful land, but of course, everybody thinks their own land is beautiful. Um, I am from the Clear Lake Basin, which is the largest body of fresh water fully within the state of California. It's about 100 miles all the way around. Um, the pieces that are in the Co Museum range from Mendocino County, um, the Valley Pomo, and also some of the Coast Pomo, and there are some Lake Pomo. So it actually kind of covers Pomo country. Um, there are 26 Pomo tribes now. Uh, there were hundreds of individual villages, but there's 26 bands of Pomo Indians now. So we were gonna start off, I believe, with uh, the doll, mm -hmm. the sculpture piece. Excellent. And I don't know if you want to introduce that piece, or if you want me to introduce it. But sorry, no, nope, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I moved faster than you. Um, I'm happy to say anything that you want, but Mio, Mio, I'm like I'm stuck in. So Mia, why don't you go ahead and say what you'd like and then I can add anything else from the coast perspective, but I'll focus okay. on keeping him carefully because he's, he's somebody that I want to hold on to. <laughs> yeah, so this piece was done by Bun Lucas. So it's a fairly contemporary piece actually. Uh, Bun Lucas was Kashaya Pomo and he carved, he carved actually many different things, um, usually out of cottonwood um, I have one of his larger pieces of a full roundhouse that he made. This one is one of his people, um, his male dancers. So let's start from the top or the, actually let's start from the bottom. So the bottom portion is, these are typical dance wear from the coast region. There's a front flap, which is it's not a breech cloth. It's not made to cover. It's not made for everyday wear. It is a flap that is worn in the front. It's very similar to a breech cloth, but I don't want it to be misconstrued as being a breech cloth. The backside, you can see all the little individual feathers are carved out. Um, the men in the Pomo country and actually across central California and some parts of Southern California wear feather skirts. And these skirts are made as um, they're netting with individual uh, feathers tied to them. The top portion is fluff because uh, along the top of the skirt, you either show the leather or you show some little feathers or you show beadwork. And so that top portion covers up the net start. And if you keep going up, so he has on, he has on uh, a hairnet, a flicker band, and horns. Go ahead and turn him. And I call them horns. They're actually called hairpins, and he has a whistle in his mouth. They're actually called hairpins. And I don't know if you can spotlight me. Mm -hmm. Oops. In a second. <laughs> there we are. So hairpins, this one is a triple hairpin and it's more of a trembler. And the one that Bess is holding, um, those hairpins are single hairpins. So um, you can see the difference between hairpins because they either go forward in the front or they go in the back out. And usually that's kind of, the forward in the front is more coastal because it symbolizes more of a deer Whereas the ones that go in the back, if you could highlight me one more time. Mm -hmm. So there would be two in the back going out. Um, 
and those would be more bird. So they either go this way or they go in the back. Um, the other thing that if we can go back to Bess, the other thing um, that he has on is a flicker band. And I wanted to show a flicker band, uh, a full size flicker band. So many people look at our flicker bands before I, before we show it to you, I wanna talk about it. The flicker band that he's wearing. And if you can indicate that with your finger, Okay, you can see it's a long strip. It's made out of individual bird feathers. And oftentimes it can take up to 30 birds to make a really long flicker band. Um, we only use certain feathers uh, for them. And when I tell people that 30 birds were, were used, um, a lot of people get really offended. They like, oh, you killed 30 birds. But I, I tell them the story of the fedora hat. Um, in the 1930s, when the fedora hat was at one of its most, I guess, uh, its most favorite, 80% of American men were wearing the fedora hat. On those hats are three flicker feather tails. So if you think about 80% of American men wearing hats, and you think about three tails, you get six to 10 tail feathers off of each bird. So during the age of fedora, we actually almost wiped out the flicker feather, the flicker bird, which is the red shafted woodpecker. Um, so if you highlight me, I'm gonna show you a full size flicker band. Wow. And so let's get close here. And then if you can hold it still a little bit, it'll give it time to focus because there's a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. The focusing? Yes. I'm gonna scroll it across slowly. So the so actual the, flicker feathers, they're trimmed, right? To make it look more uniform? Yes. Okay. And so the little black diamonds sticking up are the flicker tails. Hmm. And then all the rest of the orange feathers are, there's about, uh-oh four to eight uh, wingtip feathers that you can use. And this one we had made for my son when he was six years old. So he is now 22. Um, I did not go out and kill the birds for this. Um, we found them and a lot of roadkill. So these aren't things that you just go out and say, oh, I need a flicker band today. I think I'll go kill a bunch of birds. Really, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So the abalone that you see in the middle are, are the, the abalone buttons that you see are actually, these ones here, hold on um, the band that holds it on the head. Um, it's so that the stress is not on the bird shafts of the feather shafts themselves, but on the button. So they're actually sewn onto a tie so that they can put it around their head. So these are, um, if you want to go back to the doll, mm -hmm. these are, put these type of things are not just made. These are these are things that take a while to gather and you invest in it. The other thing that that bun put on there was a, a whistle and there's probably a little tiny cord missing because uh, I see a little indent at the end of the whistle that might have had a piece of cordage around. Um, they're worn around the neck and there are some some dances that that have a whistle uh, that they blow and some dances that they don't. So usually these they just hang it around their neck when, when they're not in use. And then the diamond shapes on his head are actually um, more of a hairnet. So I did put together a little doll on my own. Um, if you can see it, that has a hairnet. And that's what that's supposed to look like. So he has a little hairnet on. Of course, his flickers aren't real because I'm not going to make a real <laughs> flicker for a doll. 
but you can see that the diamond shape that he has. And Mio, can you speak a little bit the the band over the forehead? I mean, obviously it's incredibly beautiful, and I'm sure it has great symbolic um, qualities. Is it also is it also a sunscreen or no? Um, okay. it's it's not a sunscreen. What it is is um, and and this isn't you know it's not secret. It's sacred. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, that's fine. But, that's totally fine. No, no, it, it's okay. It's okay. I just want I just want everybody to know the context that this is my truth and what I know of, but other people may feel differently or have other stories. It depends on what tribe. So these are our our men wear these and their spirits, their their doorways. This is allows their eyes to be covered so that spirits can enter the so we as women actually have headdresses that have little tiny flicker flags hanging from it. And those are in front of us so that we have our doorways. I often joke to myself that we must be so multifaceted because we have more than one. <laughs> but, but these are, these are um, so that the men have a pathway to the spirit world when they dance. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So that was buns, and what did we have next? I think it was that gorgeous necklace. Yes, I think so. Let me put them back. I love spending time with buns piece, but it always makes me nervous because it is so lightweight because it's the cottonwood that I always, yeah. I yeah, so. It's nice to let him rest again. <laughs> <laughs> now that you don't have to be nervous about holding him. I should have said, make him dance for us, make him dance. So. <laughs> Is um, Bun still actively creating art? Bun's not here anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, he's not here anymore. His art, though, there's a lot of, he was really prolific in his art. So there are um, a lot of people that have you know, especially in Pomo country that have little pieces of his art hanging around. So I know I have, like I said, I have a full roundhouse. So mm -hmm. I feel, I actually feel really lucky uh, to have gotten that piece because mm -hmm. um, you can take the lid off and actually see the inside of the roundhouse. But I've seen his, his little dolls in different places and yeah, quite prolific, but no, he's no longer here. So what's the time frame on this so we have this and you know you can definitely adjust anything um but we have this as late 19th century so probably around 1880 that's about right yeah that's about right um if you look at the quality of it so um if we start from the top, those are um, those are small clamshells that are made. Um, they're woven or beaded in a brick stitch, and the brick stitch is almost like a flat peyote. And so they're done in a brick stitch. And then you can see that each of the abalone pieces on there are hand carved out and shape. You know the the amount of work that went into this, because you have to remember this is uh, pretty much before the age of the band saws and the wet tile saws and a lot of the hand tools that are especially items to cut glass and tile now. These are done by sandstone and pump drills um, and the beads on them um, are really small. So imagine, if you will, a pump drill that can pierce those. Yeah, so and what kind of, build, um, what kind of uh, drill bits do you all use? Or back in the so, day? Um, back in the day, originally would be a willow shoot wow. and it would be dipped in resin and then you would have obsidian powder mm. or in some cases, we have a industrial grade diamond here in Lake County, um, the Lake County diamonds. 
and you can crush those up and use those on the tip and you would just basically roll it in your hands and it just drill wow. little by little clam shells are not these washington clams which is these what these are made from are not soft they're actually a lot like porcelain um, they're they're fairly they're fairly substantial in their hardness and abalone um, if you drill it slow you have less chance of dust because both of these are are toxic when you drill them and have the dust flying everywhere you can see some of the breakage on here um, it looks like there's that this was made with cotton cotton cordage um, originally it probably been made with uh, dog bane, uh, real, real fine grade dog bane. Uh, they're, they're, oh no, come back. To fix that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to show you one of mine. So um, that's, that's very similar in style to that one. That's amazing. So this one is, I don't know if everybody can see that, um, but this one, I saw a necklace similar to this from the Berkeley Museum. And I went home and I said, I need that in my life. I need one of those. And so if you look at it, it is a, it is a brick stitch also but it's only two of them high because it's a necklace, not a choker. The one that Bess was showing is more of a choker. And these beads are a little bit bigger, although they're still fine grade, they're a little bit bigger. And my hand tooling is not as fine as the ones on there, but yeah. But you handmade those beads? I did. Oh my God. I did. <laughs> I used, oh, wow. I used to, I used a, a Dremel to cut them out and then I used sandstone to um, take the edges off. And the what I love about this is I'll wear it silver side out, but I'll show you the red side out because red abalone is California. So the red side out is just entirely different look. There we go. And you can hear it. it. Makes a lovely sound. Oh, that's awesome to be able to hear it. Could you clarify quickly, like what type of dog bean you all use in your area? Um, it's called dog bean. Okay. <laughs> So there's, there's different types of cordage materials mm -hmm. um, that people use here in California, especially in central California, we use wild iris, we use dog bane, we use um, milkweed and wild grape. And um, dog bane, there's a specific name to it, yes, but it, yeah. it literally translates to the dog bane. And yeah, grows, and I'm looking in California. It is called Indian hemp dog bean that grows in California. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Just want to clarify. It's like, it's like Cannabum, uh, Cannabum Californicus or something. Yeah. But yeah, because it is it is a uh, uh, hemp type plant. But not but actual cannabis thing. hemp. Not no. that kind of hemp. <laughs> no, it's not that kind of hemp. <laughs> we don't have that. But not at all. Uh, no, it's but hollow. free contact in a way, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a hollow, hollow plant that you actually use the outer fibers to make the twine. Cool, thank you for clarifying. Oh yeah. Can I ask a question about our piece here? Because you were speaking on your necklace about how there's this, how you can wear it with the silver side out or the red side out. Uh -huh. And the way ours, I mean, it might just be the mounting or maybe it was restrung and the lighting isn't great, but it shows the way it lays flat right now that there are pieces of abalone that are red side out and pieces that are silver side out. 
You think that right? Because a lot of a lot of the red is taken off Mm -hmm. because they made it. They they did such a finer job with taking it off. They made it almost all silver. But if you look at it, it's uh, there's so that one right there. The second one in from the yes, Mm -hmm. that one is probably turned wrong because it shows two silver. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Two silver, two red, yeah. two silver, two red. If you look at it, that's what I was wondering if it's very purposeful. If sort of mounted, like if some of them have been flipped or if there's something. Yeah. That's very, yeah. That's cool. Thank you. It's a oh. lovely necklace. Can you show the bottom part to people? Yeah. There you go. And I can lift these up a little bit. Maybe I can get better light on them. Yeah. Those are really done well. Yeah. those those are those are lovely oh, I can't wait to try that on no I'm just saying yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> like that is something that we can work with absolutely because it's a piece that was worn <laughs> come and visit and we'll definitely do that all right yeah yeah excellent so you want to start with the big one Sure. Sounds good. So this is a lattice style basket. Um, The Pomos had at least nine types of weaves that they did. Um, Everything from three rod coiling down to a simple twine. So this is called a lattice weave. And the reason why is because it's willow. If you want to bring it up closer. (laughs) And then just hold it. There you go. Perfect. So if you look at it, there's straight willows and then there's horizontal willows and then there's a wrap and that's sedge. And that sedge that wraps that willow to the other willows so that it creates almost this sieve. Um, you would think this was a big, huge colander, but, and, and it might have been a huge colander, but I really doubt that. Um, this is probably more of a storage basket because that's too much work. You can make a, an open twine basket for a colander. This is, this is serious work because it's almost like if you were coiling, you're wrapping each individual and you're keeping it um, the perfect size from each other. So there's one wrap in between each of those sticks. And as it gets a little bit further out, if you stop right there to the left-hand side, you can see where it looks like there's slight Vs those are sticks that are being added. So there's one wrap around them. And then as you go up one layer, there's two, they're split. And then can we show the bottom? Yes. I love this bottom. So it's, it's a, it's a type of, it's almost plating. It's not really twined. It's almost plating, um, but it makes it a more solid base so that you have room to put all of those sticks in without it showing so much because you wouldn't be able to start that many sticks without having a little bit of a solid uh, base in there. And then if you want to show the top where the shells are, Again, it's a more of a plating. So there's that last wrapped edge and then there's plating and then there's a little bit of twine to two rows of twine. And that's to make the edge a little bit stronger so that they could cut it flush. So the top isn't woven back down into the basket, mm-hmm. it's cut flush. And then there's shells on there. So this is definitely not like 
a basket you're going to rinse something in. This is a storage basket and it's really quite beautiful. So I did bring some materials to show. Um, so that's willow and here's some willow here and this is peeled and this is unpeeled. So these are, these are uh, really thin willows. They're not super, super small. There's a couple of little tiny ones in there, but this is probably about the thickness that that basket is. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see if I hold it, if I just kind of show you, this is about what, two feet long. So the amount of basket material that you're having in there um you're also on the bottom of the co-basket it's not crossed over there's only a couple of them that are crossed over wow. which is the bottom start of the basket so this right here is like a typical twine start you have a crossover whereas that one has maybe this kind of crossover but the reason why it's closed is so that you could add all of those sticks wow. to get it started. So here's a uh, peeled and unpeeled willow. And then the sedge, is that a root or is that a branch or a runner or another type of the plant? So it's a it's a it's a runner root. <laughs> it's, okay. a yeah, it's a runner okay so, so you're not picking so branches the, off no this okay willow you're you're cutting it down and you're taking the twigs off of it sedge is a grass and on the the roots run horizontally and they're runner roots so that they make more plants and what you're doing is it's got a tap root that goes down and then it's got runners that go across and develop other, other grass plants, other sedges. And so what you're doing is you're digging that one root. So you're following this one across. Oh my gosh. So it's about six to a foot feet, a foot down underground and you're following wow. it little by little. Oh my gosh. Because as soon as you break it, then you end up with a tiny piece and you still going to use it because that's a lot of work. <laughs> but, you know, there's a difference between this little one and this. Notice I have them both, though. <laughs> <laughs> and this is split in half. So you get two pieces out of it. So imagine how much sedge is in that basket. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you can put like, that next to my head so you can really <laughs> yeah so 18 inches across and this dates from 18 1880 1890 give or take yeah, yeah exactly I and mean, that's amazing that's in such superb condition because you think that's 130 years ago and you that's can like see the patina on it if you look at my willow this willow is about three four years old and if i pulled oh, wow. out some some other new willow it's even brighter and then you look at the patina of the co-basket and it's that beautiful mellow brown um, that it's aged to. Yeah, the patina on those kind of baskets, the sedge does the same thing. It'll age and it gets a little bit more brown and it just, it gets to me just a little more lovely. It makes the clamshells really pop. Yeah. yeah. If we want to go to that next basket. Yay. This one next, right? I think that's yes. what we were doing. Excellent. So we were looking at this basket initially and we were looking at the design of it. And there are portions of it that are stand out that are very pomo, but there are portions of it that you kind of go, Hmm, I wonder if that's truly Pomo. Mm -hmm. um, the bottom of it, you can, you can uh, partially tell with certain ways that the bottom is. Um, some of the other people that coil in Central California 
their coils there's a little tiny pinhole that it starts with there's a hole on the bottom pomos when they coil don't usually have that pinhole um some of the patterns on it are very pomo you have the morning star which is the plus pattern you have the side the side ones those larger patterns which um can be either a turtle back or a deer hoof mm -hmm. um but then you have the little pieces of different colors kind of in there randomly this work is is fine work um as far as like just the the way it's woven the materials being spaced perfectly um but it's also considered more rough also because and i don't mean the rough in a bad way <laughs> <laughs> that's the pomo in me um but it's because the sedge root is so large even though it's done really well if you do closer and just kind of just stop where you are yeah you can see how much work went into making all those sedge roots uh perfectly sized so that they're all gauged the same the same size that's incredible and if you pull it back you can see, um, so the black design um, is probably bulrush. We have two types of, of uh, darker materials that we use. And I brought one out and this one is redbud, which, um, so redbud is actually the, um, there we go. Can you see it good? Yeah. It's, it's uh, the red bud bush. And what you do is you take the, the larger um, sticks off of it and you um, split them. So the red is actually the outside of it. And this inside part is the part you kind of shave off to get it nice and thin. So you, the way you cut red bud, you also have to shave it so that no white is showing. So what you're doing is you're angling it as you're cutting it so that the, just the red shows. Um, so we had initially thought that this basket might be my do, uh, but it is a three rod and which is pretty sure that it's Pomo. Uh, we're the ones that use the most on the three rods. So, um, and it's been repaired on the rim a little bit uh there's there's some glue um you know repairing has has changed over the years um mm -hmm. but still it's a beautiful basket and it really shows um a lot of work on the sedge because it's so uniform can we see a little bit more of the inside the interior yeah I'm just being nosy. No. <laughs> so you can see the design carries on the inside also. So if you look at a basket like a, um, I think it's a hoopa basket, some of the designs don't carry on the inside because of the way they twist uh, their materials. You don't see that outside, um, that outside pattern on the inside. But because most of the pomo baskets, the sedge or the the bulrush, the bulrush is black, or the red of the red bud, you stitch and you pull it all the way around to make a coil so you can see the the same pattern on the inside. That's really beautiful. So I think that the next basket that we're going to look at is the beaded basket. Yes. So and this is a the comparison one too, if you right. want. So, yeah. so this is a Pomo style 
well, this is pomo beaded basket. So the pomos incorporate the beads onto the basket. So each one of those, if you hold it real still, each one of those has a piece of sedge in it that that is so they string the bead on the sedge and then they stitch it down. And where you are, if you could move to your left just a tad to show that bottom, that bottom triangle. That good? On the bottom of the basket. Okay. The yeah. colored bead. Got it. So typically on a pomo basket, there is something called a dow. And that's a doorway and opening um, to where um, the spirit of your basket is allowed in and it's not perfect. Um, with beaded baskets, it's hard to, oh, can you just see me? Um, can you highlight best? I had to mute myself because the dogs were barking, but only Bess is on. Do you want to be highlighted? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Oh, somebody was. No, we're just looking at the basket. Time. Sorry. So when you have a beaded basket, you don't have that woven design to change, uh, to make a break in the pattern. So what they did instead is they used a brighter colored bead. If you look there where, where Bess is pointing, there is a brighter red bead. And that opens the design up in that particular pattern. If we go to the side patterns and go ahead and make the turns, just turn the basket. You can see this is a flint point. Go ahead and keep going. And you can see it goes three beads and then there's a triangle, three beads and then the triangle. And she's gonna keep going all the way around. And there's gonna be one area that makes the change and that's coming up. <laughs> and here we go. If you look at all of the rest had the three beads and then it had the triangle, the two, two, two and two. So when you get to this area, it makes that break. It goes up and it actually makes a larger triangle zigzag and it goes up above that other, that other um, set of design patterns. So that's actually the dowel for that pattern also. So then wanted to show you, uh, we'll come back to that one. Can we show the washo? Yeah, I wanted to show you, I knew that last time we were talking, I was like, I know there's something in the blue that too. That little green one? There's the little green one in case you didn't yeah. see it. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's where that was. <laughs> so this is a washo basket. And one of the reasons, how did I know that this was not a pomo basket? The first thing is, is that it's woven the it's beaded on top of a basket we didn't do that um, our beads are woven stitched into the basket washos actually um do these beautiful baskets that are just they're plain and then they bead the design over it so it's a it's a secondary layer on top of the basket if you hold it like you are and slightly, yeah, you can right. see the inside of the rim, that bat, that beadwork is not hooked into the basket. It's actually sewn around it and then uh, it's not stitched individually into it. So it's actually bead weaving on, it's peyote stitch on top of the basket. And it's beautiful. Um, this really is a lovely piece and it's complicated. You can also tell that um, a lot of the other tribes in California don't have dows or their dows are, are different, uh, how they let the spirits into their basket. 
So if you look at that star pattern on the bottom, um, there's no there's no obvious mistake. Whereas if you're looking at a pomo basket, there would be an obvious mistake. Um, there would have to be that imperfection to allow the spirit in. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to say thank you from the coast side because we had this in our catalog in our database listed as POMO. And so it's so nice to be able to talk with you and to be able to continue to adapt and correct anything in our database that was there. So you provided a lot of information for us. So, so we are very, very grateful for that. So thank you. As much as I'd like to claim that basket, it is a beautiful Washoe basket. Um, but I think that's part of the importance of having um, tribal people come in and look at the collections. You know, you can see if you look at them together, had you not known that the pomo stitched individually, you would say, "Oh, those are both those are both beaded pomo baskets," mm -hmm. but they're not. Yeah. And now that you know about the dowels, when you look at a pomo basket, you're going to look at it and you're going to go, oh, I wonder where the dowel is on this. And if there is no dowel, they might be a very contemporary weaver that doesn't want to break their design or it's not pomo. Hmm. Yeah. Can you show that little green bead again? Yeah. <laughs> and now I can always find it, but when we were talking on Friday. Yeah. So there's that one little green bead and it's in this really kind of flat expanse of blue beads. Mm -hmm. So why is it there if there's no design mechanism in there? The reason why it's in there is because that is a design. If you look at it, it goes one, two, three, four, one direction, and then it switches directions. And then it goes, so it's actually, it actually is a design. It's a zigzag design. The blue beads, if you look at them, they're in a zigzag. They're in a vertical zigzag up and down. And so that is a design element. And that's why they use the green bead to break it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, so yeah. oh, you can see the green this time. You can see the green this time. That's... I was really hoping. I feel like the lighting hasn't been as good for some of the other pieces, but. No, good. you can really see that. You can see the green iridescence on it. So this is a coil basket. It's pomo. Um, and it's a feather basket, which is where what my people are known for. And you can see that's lovely um so there's two types of feathers on here there's a mallard neck which is that ring of iridescent feathers around the mallard's neck and then the little black ones are quail tops those are the little the little tips of the quail on their head um and so you have to kill the birds to get these <laughs> But they're both edible birds. <laughs> and the the neck feathers, when you when you when you take down your bird, you're gonna take that little ring of feathers off and you salt it so that it dries without all of the germ, the bacteria and such. So you're gonna dry it and make it flat. When you start weaving this as you make your coil basket. You're going to pull out a few feathers at, at a time and you're going to stitch each one of them down. So you pull out a little, like a little bunch of three, and then you stitch that down. Yeah, if you tilt it down, there you go. Now you can see. So each of these little feathers are stitched down and they're, it takes precision to make it lay in the same direction because what you're doing is you're taking your feathers you're holding it down and then you're creating that stitch 
and you're keeping the feathers straight enough so that the feathers maintain that kind of circular motion and it has the best side out. So if we, so if we switch baskets to the other one, So you can see um, if, yeah, I've tilt it slightly so the rim's out more. There you go. You can see how these are stitched in. The quail tops do a little bit different because they're kind of, you put an all in and you, you push them in a little bit deeper so that they stick straight out. Um, if you show the bottom side of this, You can see that circular motion, but you can also see where they were kind of clipped in order to make it a little more flat so that the pattern lays. You can see how it lays down. This is metal lark, by the way. Um, we have different types of feathers that we use in our baskets. You can see blue jay, you can see mallard, uh, that iridescent green, you can see uh, meadow lark, which ranges from this kind of almost pastel yellow to a very deep canary, um, red wing blackbird, and the tricolored red wing blackbird have almost uh, the tricolored has a yellow to orange to red. The red wing blackbird has a just a really vibrant red to it. Um, woodpeckers we use. There's several different uh, birds that we use for the color. You can tell this is a metal lark because it has those little black spots on them. Because um, there's an oriole too that we use, but the orioles don't have the black spots and they're usually a little more um, goldenrod color. Whereas the metal larks are almost like a true yellow, a pastel yellow to a really almost maize colored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is much more yellow than it's coming through on the screen, so. Yeah. yeah. And it also depends on how you look at it too. Yeah. If you have certain lights pointing at it, um, if it was a more of a warm tone, yeah, you can see with more of a warm tone that it has more yellow fluorescence, give, bring the blue out a little bit more and make it almost a green tinge, but it's really not. In, in person, it's it's actually really a pastel yellow. Absolutely, absolutely. I loved how you, you were telling us on Friday about them hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, the cord and how they're usually seen in Pomo houses. Yeah. Would you like to talk so, about that? Does that cord work? It, let me... Let me put it down and then it's so delicate. But yes, this one does. But I'll keep my hand underneath it. So that there you go. Oh my gosh. So if you look at, okay, so this basket probably wouldn't be hung all over because it's such, it's a miniature. But mm -hmm. if you look at some of the full size feather baskets, um, always usually they have a either cordage of clamshell or just the cordage. It usually has clamshells on it because if you're going to go big, you might as well go big, mm -hmm. you know? So it'll have um, a clamshell cordage mix or it'd have cordage with a lot of clamshells or a little bit of clamshells. And if you look at the way the house of, of Pobos are built, um, specifically the Thule houses, the bark houses have a different structure, but it does the same thing. Um, the Thule houses have a willow frame in them. And that willow frame, it creates almost like a grid pattern on top. So you could actually hang your baskets from the rafters. Um, typically with Pobo Homes, we're shown, our Pomo homes are shown and we look like we're from the Shire. We look like we're hobbits, but the real, <laughs> the real uh, Pomo Tule houses are about 10 to 12 feet tall and they're about 25 feet long. So they're the size of a, of a large trailer. 
Um, they are actually homes. Uh, mm -hmm. The majority of the living was done in outdoor spaces, but that sleeping area. So you could hang things and actually look at it as you're laying down. And one of those things is the gift baskets. If you look at the bottom of these baskets, this one doesn't have the abalone hanging, but it's meant to be looked from the bottom. And the larger ones have abalone pieces hanging or the basket design, the design itself is done with feathers from the bottom. And those are meant to be hung so that you look at them from the bottom. So some of the larger gift baskets that a woman may bring in for her dowry or when, when they're married, when large events happen, um, their, their place within the tribe, they have these big, large gift baskets. And if you hang them from the top of the, the house, when you're laying down, you look at them and they're actually very representational of the solar systems, the celestial systems. You look at them and they look like stars against the sky. Um, so everybody run out and get a Pomo gift basket. <laughs> oh yeah, no problem. <laughs> Hang it up. <laughs> but they're really, they really are, they're meant to be shown on the bottom. That's why the abalone drips down further than the basket generally. Was there another piece? That's it on our so, side. Yeah, if people want, I can allow everyone. Actually, you guys, we trusted you. You can unmute yourself if you mm -hmm. want to ask a question directly. Yeah. I know there's several very prominent basket weavers here, basket makers. Oh, I have one. I have a question. Yeah. Um, the the hairnet in that we saw on the doll. Did the did the men have um, special feeling about their hair, and does it grow, and is it uh, gathered up in that hairnet? So, I'll step carefully when I answer this one for you. Yes, because hair is not viewed by everybody the same. Right. There is almost a, and I'll probably get in trouble for this. But no, I don't care. <laughs> There's almost this kind of reverence equated with hair on certain tribal levels. Oh. The Pomo people, while I don't speak for all P Pomo people, again, this is just my truth. And these are things that I've learned in my lifetime. Um, there isn't that same reverence to the hair that um, other tribes have for it. There is, yeah, there is no, no braiding ceremony for the majority of our people in Pomo country. You know, there are men with long hair and it's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. I love some long hair too, but um, there is no there's not a lot of reverence equated with it because here in California, a lot of us are boarding school kids. And so the majority of men in Pomo country are just now starting to grow their hair out. But those nets are not really meant to hold the hair. What they're meant to do is give you a base to put your hairpins in. So if we look at it, Mm -hmm. so these it's meant to give you a base to go in and out of so that you can put them in that's yeah. what the hairnet is for um, the hairnet in every day is a lot less um, it actually is a little bit longer um, mm -hmm. for the everyday wear and it's more to kind of just keep it out of your face for hunters and such oh, okay. thank cool. you uh-huh. I'll go ahead and go. Uh, my name is Nicole, and I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you for uh, the information you're sharing with us, Mayo. And thank you, um, America and Bess. 
for the information. Thank you for clarifying that on the hemp thing too. That, but you know, it it's very important for for me that I learn these ways, and so um, the information you're sharing it, it means a lot. It really does mean a lot. I'm Kashaya Pomo from uh, Stewart's Point, and um, you know, I I have a lot to learn, and so I'm very grateful to be here. That's all. I don't really have any questions. I'm just grateful. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, you know, I recognize the name actually, because <laughs> you're my, my husband's cousin. <laughs> so <laughs> I know I'm scanning for names that I know. No, I'm just joking. Um, you know what though? It's, it's, you know, when you, when you look at basketry and when you look at all these different things, you know, it takes a lifetime to learn it. So, you know, whatever you don't know, eventually you will know whatever creators got in store for you, you'll get it, you know, and, and everybody's sharing their stories now. So this is a good thing. I feel as though I'm getting off easy. Nobody's asking me the hard <laughs> question. <laughs> We're just happy we got to see you so much. <laughs> well, do you have any, um, are you going to be speaking again online? Do you have future uh, workshops or talks you have planned? I am. Um, yeah. I actually do a lot of classes out in the world. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I don't know if it's a mission thing or if it's, you know, it's just, it's something, you know, I think during the this pandemic it is almost something we need to share with each other we need to keep things going we need to provide a new normalcy normalcy or however you pronounce it but i do share a lot with with people my classes usually run all different age groups um they're generally from uh pomo country but there are some that are opened up uh, to everybody. Um, I will be speaking on the 21st of April and that will be, it's sponsored by News from Native California. Oh, cool. And it's also sponsored by the California Indian Museum and Culture Center. And that's called Shelter in Place. And it's the artwork from Pomo Country. Um, I'm going to be speaking on a panel, just three of us talking. Uh, Eric Wilder from Kashaya Pomo, Bonnie Lockhart from Sherwood Valley, and me. And we'll be doing at 6 p.m. Pacific time on the 21st. Cool. So if people follow uh, news from Native California online or go to their website, they'll be able to find all the details? And yes. In fact, that in flyer will be coming out here probably um tomorrow it should be posted cool. if not i'll be posting it okay um yeah news from native california for those who live on the east coast and may not know news from native california is a magazine put out um specifically for california indians what's going on in our world what's going on in our environment um and it comes out quarterly and it's printed by heyday books yeah And then so there, other, go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, there was a question in the chat. When you discussed uh, removing feathers from the mallard uh, neck, could you talk about for other different types of birds, are the skins dried and the feathers taken like, you know, bit by bit as you weave or? Okay, so for, for basketry feathers, generally it's the skin and then the feathers because if you look at them, Bess, I don't know if you can show um, one of those again, if you look at them, the feathers are really small. So it's not something you're going to pluck and then just throw in a bag. What you're mm -hmm. going to do is okay. you're going to dry the skins. Thank you. Um, so meadowlarks, um, the scalps of the woodpeckers, the shoulders of the red-winged blackbirds, the mm -hmm. meadowlark, that's their breast feathers. Um, you can also use some flicker feather breast feathers, which is a white with polka dots on it. Um, those are skins that you dry out and you keep it on the skin and then you pull it as you need them. 
because they're too small to just have in a baggie and try and deal with. So you lay the, lay the skins out. Um, so for basketry feathers, you do, that's what you do is, is dry them flat. For feathers that you're using and everything else, you really do want to get those feathers off the birds as soon as possible, um, just so that there's no bacteria that gets growing. There's no little bugs that eat those, eat them up. Um, the flicker band that I showed, you can see there's no bug damage on it. Um, the lighter marks, that's actually sweat. So the salts will mm. change, um, change the color of the flickers. So if I pulled it close, you can see you, their bug damage would be indicated by little white spots. These kind of lighter areas are um, either the lighter feathers of the wings or it's been, uh, has salt from the sweat on it. Were there any other questions in the chat? There's a lot of things, so I'll try to save the chat so you can read it at your leisure. Yeah, so last call. <laughs> okay, well, a lot of people are thanking you and I really appreciate the time you spent with us and all the information you shared with us so generously. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see you hopefully in Santa Fe sometime. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to get there. I really... You know, the fact that you have some Pomo pieces really, really makes me feel good. And you have some really nice ones too. Thank so you. I can't wait to come see what the rest of your collection looks like, Absolutely. you know, because we're more than just Pomo. We're everybody, you know, <laughs> we want to see all of it. So I, and thank you for having me here. It was lovely to talk about the collection, but also to see everybody. Um, I see some names and some faces that I know and love. So really appreciate seeing all of you and all of you who came out to hear me listen to me you know if you have questions you can always um i'm on facebook i'm on instagram my handles are mio marufo so if you want a friend request me i put my own artwork up uh you can see my trivial life but <laughs> <laughs> it'll be fun really <laughs> fun yeah. okay well with that um we'll see you all in the future we'll be back next month with another conversation and um i will try to post uh, information about your upcoming talk so have a okay. wonderful day everybody thanks everyone thank you bye bye, bye.